Welcome to Living Word, growing a family that experiences every promise of God. You're listening to another life-changing word from Pastor Scott Anderson. For more information, visit our website at livingwordonline.com. So Jesus and his disciples, they show up at an Applebee's, and uh, the hostess says, how many? Jesus says, we need a table for 26. And the hostess looks around, and she knows there's only 13 of them there. She goes, okay, so we're waiting for more. And Jesus goes, no, 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 we're, we're, we're good. Yeah, we need a table for 26. We're all here. She goes, but there's only 13 of you here. And Jesus goes, yeah, we all like to sit on the same side of the table. Come on, somebody out there. They sit on the same side of the table. <laughs> how many people know that God wants us to sit on both sides of the table? That's how God, that's where our series is today. We continue on the series that God is a God of both. The world wants to, and oftentimes religion wants to say that he's a God of this or that. But we're finding out that God is a God of this and that. That we don't need to put limits on God. That we don't need to put God in a box. That we, we, we should never put a ceiling on God and what can God do and what God can't do. And our scripture from this series is John 10, 10. says the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Remember that. Uh, as we're talking today, when problems come into our life, and we even talked about it last week with the weeds and the wheat, that the guy was doing everything right, but the enemy came and put some weeds into his garden. And everybody around goes, oh, I thought you were doing the right thing. And he's like, no, 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 it wasn't me. It wasn't God. It was the enemy that put the weeds. But we found out last week that God is a God of both, and God can bless your wheat and your weeds. Some of our biggest victories in life will come out of some of our biggest messes that happen in our world. And the enemy gets trampled on every time he thinks that he can put a weed in my garden. Guess what? God will take that and turn it for good and make my weed into something epic and into something amazing. Because God is a God of both. That scripture continues to go on. For Jesus was sent so that Jesus, I come so that you could have life and you could have it more abundantly. That means that superior in quality and superior in quantity. That God doesn't want us just to have this or that. Like the world says, if you want quality, you can't have quantity. If you want quantity, you can't have quality. God says that you can have your cake and you can eat it too. You can have quality and you can have quantity. That I am a God of both. I can bless you on the mountaintops and I can bless you on the valleys. I can bless you when you go in and I'll go ahead and bless you when you go out. God's not limited to just bless your left hand or your right hand. He says, I'll bless both of your hands and whatever your hands touch in this life. As I was going to the Taco Bell, I kind of heard Holly's voice in the background of my mind saying, just get one thing. Just get one. And as I pulled up and I was looking at it, I I kind of wanted a chalupa and a gordita. I wanted them. But Holly's voice of just getting one. But then I felt like I heard God's voice that says, I'm a God of both. Get your gordita and get your chalupa. How many people know, come on somebody out there, that he's a God of the chalupa and the gordita. That we don't have to limit what we can have and what we can do and what we can experience. Just because man told you, man, you can't be good at this and that. I know I can't, but I know that Christ that dwells in me can be great at everything that is in front of me. That I can do this and I can do that. That I can be a great leader and operate in compassion. That I can be a great business person or, or have success in the financial world and also be a great father and a great mother. That I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. I'm not bound to this or that because I serve a God of both. Today we're going to talk about how to tap into 24-7 of God's blessings in our lives. You know, God's blessings have been oftentimes, I call it a kink in the hose for many Christians, where they're not experiencing God's best and God's blessings all the time in their life. And yes, I get it that we'll have weeds in our life, but God can bless you in the midst of your weeds. That God can bless you in the midst of your problems and your circumstances. That God can still flow great things to you. You see that in the scripture, oftentimes the prophet would find somewhere in the desert and God would bless him with some food and some water and some shelter. And God just seems to bring in the midst of our mess everything we need. But man, since the beginning, has been putting a limit on God. Saying, well, God can... 
You know, he can, he can bless you here, but he can't bless you there. You know, we'll even say that, oh, they're going through some hard times. You know, must have been some decisions that they made. God, they must have removed themselves from God's protection and removed themselves from God's blessing and God's best. Once again, we're putting limits on God and not realizing that God can bless us in our great decisions and in our bad decisions. That God can bless us even in the valleys and in the desert. That even when I'm in the middle of an addiction, God can still get his blessings to me. And there's only one thing in this world that can stop God's blessings from getting to you. And that's me and that's you. That's ourselves. That's our thinking. That's what puts a kink in the hose. Whatever you believe, you will receive. So if you believe that God can bless you in the midst of the mess, God finds a way for that to flow to you. But if you have the belief that God can only bless me when I live a perfect life and whenever, only when I do the right things and only when I'm making the right decisions, here's the problem is your subconscious gets to the end of the day and says, yeah, but you kind of went off on this person. Remember when you were all angry and rude? Remember how you did that? Remember you were a little lazy at the job? Remember you gossiped a little? You may not hear it out loud, but at the end of the day, your subconscious goes, oh, if God only blesses us in our good things and our perfect days, then I can't get blessed today because I didn't seem to live up to the rules that were put on me. You put a kink in your hose. I say that because I remember, some of you remember the hoses of the 80s. That old green hose that was out back, mama lock you out of the house till you go out and play. And you get thirsty and you turn on that green hose and the water in it was about 180 degrees. And what came out of it was not natural. I drank that water, and many believe that's why I'm not six foot two today. Many believe that that's one of the reasons I can see through walls sometimes because of the water that was in that hose. You go to spray down the carport or spray your car down, and if that, wa- that hose, the sun got it, it would just kink right up. And all of a sudden, there's no water that could flow out of that. None at all. And, you know, you could go over and turn the water up. It wouldn't matter, right? It wasn't the water department not sending you water. You didn't need more water. You just needed to get the kink out of the hose. And so many times Christians find themselves, God, I need more. God, I need more power. God, I need more blessings. And God's like, you don't need more. You just need to unkink the hose that you have. And the unkinking is that thinking, right? That thinking that God can only bless me in my right decisions, in my right things. You kinked up the hose. But an unkink of today is where you and I recognize that God wants to bless me all day, wherever I'm at, whatever I'm doing in my life, God wants to get a way to get the blessings to you and to me. The Bible says that uh, Jesus talked about, you know what, if you as a good father give good things to your children, how many, how much more is your father God? That's what my God is. My God is a God that wants to get good things to me in the midst of my junk. Our scripture today is going to be 2 Corinthians 1.20. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ and amen. God's promises are yes and amen. It doesn't say that his promises are if you do everything right. He says, my promises are yes and amen. That if you believe in it, that they can come into your life. He doesn't say, well, if you didn't gossip today or if you worked hard today. He said, no, I'm a God of both. It's not just yes, but it's also amen. I think about my kids You know, my children enjoy my blessings that I have bestowed upon them. You get on home, and for my kids, I'm not withholding anything good from them. They can walk into the house, and they can enjoy the air conditioning. They can enjoy the Netflix, the television. They can even go into the pantry and get a Pop-Tart. That is for you. You can go in the refrigerator, and there's cheese crisps, and there's tortillas, and there'll be some orange crust maybe in there. And in the refrigerator is dad's best readily available for each and every one of them, none of which are being withheld. They don't walk up to the refrigerator, go to pull it, and it goes, hey, you teased your sister today. I'm sorry. There'll be no cheese crisps for you. Your dad is withholding God's best from your life. But instead, everything throughout the house is there and available for them. You know, if I came home and a couple of my kids today maybe were sitting on the couch in the dark and I overhear them talking to each other going, yeah, it's just, woe is me. My transgressions have stopped God's best, dad's best from flowing into my life. Wish I could have a Pop-Tart, but because of the things that I've done today, I surely can't. Oh, father, oh, father. 
Is there any way that you could spare just a morsel of food for me? Maybe a little bit of air conditioning. Is there any way that you could get this to me today? And I would simply go, hey, dummy, go get a Pop-Tart. They're right there in the pantry. Turn on the TV, watch the Netflix. I'm not withholding anything from your life. Your thinking is keeping you from enjoying the blessings that I have for you. It's not me, but it's the way that you're thinking. And so many of us out there got to get that old mindset out and realize that God wants to bless you all the time, that he's not withholding stuff from you and from me. You know, we've been preconditioned by the world to think that, you know, anytime I make a mistake, I get cut off from relationships. And that's what transfers oftentimes in our relationship with God. When I make a mis- mistake, man, I've been, I, I, I get cut off, right? It's, 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 it's gone. It's over. Maybe I can work my back, way back into God's good graces. I had uh, internet trouble. And uh, so a couple weeks ago, I called the company out, and they came out. They can't come in the house. They came out, checked stuff on the street, and didn't fix anything. And so I called them again, and they came out this last Tuesday. And so I got a text from the, the guy. He's like, hey, I'm on my way. So I said, cool. And he said, gate code. I gave him the gate code. And he's like, I'm here. And I went outside. And he's just a good old boy. It was what, you know how you get around that personality? Like, you feel like you're brothers, like right away. Like, you're, you've been friends forever. You used to start talking. We're laughing. We're kidding around. Find out he graduated like the same year for me. He graduated from Mesa High. He knew some people, some wrestlers. I knew some people from the church. And we're just talking. We're laughing, having a good time. And so I, I gave him one of my knives. I said, here you go. And I was talking about the different ones. And well, I mentioned that we have a smaller one of that version. And you could tell that his eyes kind of lit up. He didn't say so, but you could tell... I think he wanted the smaller one of the two. And then all, out of nowhere, he goes, you know what? I'm a, if it's all right with you, I'll break the rules. I'll go in the house. I think I can fix some stuff if I can go in the house. He's like, will you let me go in the house? I said, sure. He goes, well, make sure you don't tell anyone. I said, I would never tell everyone watching online or my Sunday service that you came in the house. I would not do that. And so he came in the house, and uh, that was pure comedy. And so... He came in the house and he was working on some stuff and I got to thinking, I'm like, you know what, I'm going to go up to the shop and I'm going to go get uh, him the smaller knife. And so I went to the shop, I got back and uh, he wasn't there, he was gone. And so I was like, oh, dang it. And so I I texted him, I said, did I miss you? And uh, time goes by and all of a sudden I get a text back from him. He goes, hey, that's weird, please don't text me again. And I went, what? Wow, I thought we were doing, I don't know what's going on here. Then I looked at my text that I had sent, and they'll show it up there on the board. When I meant to say, did I miss you, I, I forgot the did, and I simply texted this strange man, I miss you. I guess he thought that was a little creepy, and weird, right, that I would text him after just knowing him for a day. Hey, bud, what are you doing tonight? Yeah. And so, it, it, isn't that funny how one mistake can cut off a relationship, but that's not how God works. God is not a one and done God. God is not a one mistake and you're out. But our God is a God of mercy and grace. And he does not withhold any good thing from you and from me. The only thing that stops it is our belief. What I believe is what I'm going to receive in this lifetime. As I was going over this sermon on, on uh, Thursday night, I was driving down the road and I got to the part right there where I said, God will not withhold any good thing. As soon as I said that, my mind attached to a scripture. I go, wait a second. There's a scripture that says God will not withhold any good thing. And I thought to myself, now, how does that end? I'm, I'm trying to think. I'm like, does it? And I thought to myself, I go, God will not withhold any good thing to those that believe. I, I, I think that's what it says. So I whipped across a couple lanes of traffic. I pulled over in a neighborhood and I looked it up. I was, so, I was like, how did I miss this scripture? How is this scripture not in my teaching? And so as I opened up the Bible and I found, or as I opened it up and I found this scripture in Psalms 84, 11 says, for the Lord, your God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. And I went, no, there it is. There's the, the limit. There it is right there. He won't withhold, but he, walk without blameless. I'm like, come on, God, why is that the script? I can't use that scripture doesn't go with my sermon. And then I got to thinking about David, who probably wrote that. And I'm like, what are you talking about, David? You didn't walk. You probably, just like me or anybody else, you didn't have a day where you were blameless. So why would you even put that in there? We all sin. We all make mistakes. We all do. And David, guess what? You made some big mistakes, bigger than I have made, David. 
right? And I'm talking now to God and David. I'm like, David, you know, you slept with your neighbor's wife, you got her pregnant, then you had her, her husband murdered, and you married her. And, and you didn't even lose the kingdom. And then I got to thinking, but Saul lost the kingdom, and all Saul did was a little impatient. I mean, you kind of read it, you're like, he was a little impatient. And because of that, he, he lost the entire kingdom. David does far worse and doesn't lose the kingdom. Actually, you know, David at Bathsheba end up having Solomon, who ends up being the wisest, richest person ever to, to, to be on this earth. And we'll talk about that next week, how God will bless your biggest mistakes and make it the biggest victories in your life. That he'll take that horrible, bad decision that you want to condemn yourself over, but he wants to use it to make it big in your life. I'm like, so David does this and Saul does that. And then this is what I believe. I believe that Saul was under the belief of one and done. That, you know what, God can't bless you in your mistakes, that God can't do anything. And his belief was what brought it into his life. While David had a grasp of grace and of mercy that was way ahead of his time. And David made plenty and a lot of mistakes. But God was always seemed to get God's blessings right flowing into David's life. And as I thought about that, I thought, isn't there a scripture that talks about being blameless in front of God? And so I looked that up and I got right here to uh, uh, Colossians 1.22. He is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. I said, God, you have just put the puzzle piece together. Your word says in the old that God blesses and holds nothing back from those that are blameless. Then I see in the New Testament because Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. He paid the price for my sin that I can boldly and confidently walk into the throne room of God being blameless because I've been redeemed by the blood of the lamb that now no good thing can be withheld from me because I am blameless. Is there an amen and a honk anywhere out there? That I can have all of the Pop-Tarts and the Netflix and the internet, everything good that God has in my life is no longer limited to my good actions. But because of the price that Jesus paid, I am blameless. And because of that, no good thing can be withheld from me. You know, God's blessings, I was trying to think of how to kind of give a picture of God's blessings. My parents talk about now as they're getting a little bit older, that as you get older, you lose the, the, the feeling in your face. And that's why maybe when you're eating, you know, dinner or breakfast with your, one of your grandparents or something, sometimes they'll get like, you ever get that where you're like watching and they have, and you're like, hey, grandpa, and like, and, and like a half a banana. And you're like, how did the half a banana not, you didn't feel that up on your face? I don't know, you know, what, but okay, that's fine. I was out to dinner with a, an older pastor that was mentoring me. And uh, we were eating there and he was eating a salad. And while he was eating, he got a, like a, not a little bit, but it was like a cheese ball just right up on there where you're just, and as he's talking, it's like bouncing up and down and up and down. And our relationship wasn't one where I go, hey pig, you know, don't be a slob. Why, you know, like we weren't there yet at the relationship. And so I just had to sit there and wish for it to fall. In my mind, I'm like, fall, fall, fall. I even tried the force where I'm like, fall. Come on, bring that up. There you now. And it just hung. I don't even know today how it just hung on word after word after word. I began to pray. I'm like, God, your word says that I can move a mountain. I'm just asking to move a stinking little cheese ball off of his mouth. It never fell. It was there the entire, I believe it's probably still there today. I don't know where he's at, but I'm sure that it, maybe it's still there today, that cheese ball. So I was at the Starbucks and I was uh, in, this is back before we were inside. I was in the line and I'm a social distancing guy kind of anyway, especially with strangers. I like to kind of keep my, I don't like when somebody's like right up on me, you know, and, I, and so I like to keep my distance. But I'm in this line and I'm getting a little frustrated because there's only four people in line, but I happen to have two of those people who get up to the front and they're just like, ah, uh, and you're like a Starbucks, right? Give them an Italian word and a drink. That's all you got to do and move on. That's all you got to do. Make it quick, make it easy. And then you got the guy that goes, so now what's an espresso? And you go, well, you know that Google is there so you don't ask dumb questions. You had plenty of time to Google that. You didn't have to ask the question. This is not a big deal. And I'm sitting there waiting and waiting. Finally, the guy up here gets done, and he goes like this. But he's ever had that where somebody does the, the, they do the move where he goes this way, and then he jukes and he goes this way. And as he juked, I stepped 
kind of on him. I didn't know what he was doing, and we kind of stepped, and now we're together, and he's kind of looking at me, and I'm looking at him, kind of in a not-so-pastor way, like, what do you, there's nothing that way. I don't even know why you're going that direction. There's absolutely nothing over, everything is this way, right? And he kind of gets out of the way, and so then I go to step up to the register, and what I didn't notice is an elderly gentleman had stepped up. He had a question for the front, and I stepped right on this elderly. Now, I've stepped on two people in the last three seconds, and the elderly gentleman, he was my height, and so he turned to me, and we were literally face to face about this close. I've never been that close to another man in my entire life. As I looked at him, I could see out of my peripherals that he had way too much muffin up in his beard and all over. Like, it, uh, like even if I tried to get that much muffin stuck to my face, there's no way that I could possibly ever get that much muffin on my face. And we looked right there and all of a sudden, I, you ever see what's going to happen before it happened? Because I was like, ah, uh, I had my mouth kind of open. And then I saw him, right, saying something and his muffin going all over my face. And so I was trying, I was like, God, please, if he says something, don't give him any peas. No peas, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Not one pea, right? And sure enough, he goes, pardon me. Blueberry muffin shot into my mouth. I know it's blueberry because it was now in my mouth. It was about two-thirds of a blueberry muffin now that I was chewing on. What I wanted to say is I think that God's blessings are like that blueberry muffin, that it's just a part in me, and God gets that blueberry muffin all over our life. It comes from the north, the south, the east, and the west. It comes from the boss that we couldn't stand. It comes all to traffic. It comes from that brother-in-law that we couldn't handle and be around. All of a sudden, God's blessings begin to seep up in our life. Come on, is there an amen anywhere? Who wants that blueberry muffin? I want that blueberry muffin part that just seems to get all up in my business where God's best is flowing to every area of our lives. I'm going to close with this last uh, story here. You can go to Genesis 48, 17 and 19, 17 through 19. Talk about three generations here, Abraham, Isaac, and then Jacob and Esau. Three generations here. You know, God gave a word to Abraham. His word was a word of favor. And it's the same word that God has given to you and me that talks about in the New Testament that we have that same Abraham favor on our lives. That God said, I'm going to bless your descendants. And it's important to note that God didn't say, I'm just going to bless the oldest. Right? I'm just going to bless the oldest child. No, I'm going to bless all of your descendants is the word that God had. But how quickly do we put a man-made rule and put God in a box? Here we go with Abraham's child. One generation later, Isaac is on the scene talking about only having one blessing. God never said one blessing. Where did you get one blessing from? The almighty, all-powerful God has only got one blessing that he can give. You know, anytime that we put God in a box and we limit God, we make a mess. Isaac's whole family became a mess. The kids fought all the way through adulthood with one another, all trying to get this single blessing right? Because we think that God's blessings are like a piece of pie, right? There's only so many slices to go around. But the Bible talks about his blessings being like a river. There's enough for me. There's enough for you. There's enough for everybody. You got to just get on in the river and enjoy God's best. We all, there's enough for everyone. And so the home gets torn apart. Abraham or Isaac and his wife are battling over which kid is going to get the blessing. Isaac says to Esau, hey, I want to give you the blessing. Go get me some food. Well, the wife hears about this, and she tells Jacob, and Jacob deceives his father, whose eyes are near blind, and he steals the blessing. And then here comes Esau back in, and for Esau, hey, Dad, where's my blessing? He said, I already gave it away. So interesting to me. You gave it away. Why can't you get another one? It's not like you're at Peter Piper and it's tokens. You're like, sorry, kids, I'm out of tokens. You can't do that with blessings. Yeah, I had two. I lost the other blessings somewhere. I don't know where it went. I only had one. You only got one? You got all the blessings? It's infinite how many blessings you can get. I can bless you. I can bless you. I can bless you. I can bless. Not, I'm not limited, nor is God limited to the blessings I can get. Well, now Jacob runs out. See, Isaac didn't realize that God's a God of both. Many years later, Jacob and Esau meet up again. And Jacob's like, hey, let me give you some of, the, of my blessings. And Esau goes, Esau's like, I probably have more blessings than you. I don't need your stuff. Why? Because God's not a limited God. God can bless Jacob and Esau. 
because God's a God of both. It was amazing what God was able to do. We got to stop limiting our God. Now you take this lesson that Jacob learned to the end of his life, and now Joseph brings his two kids to him. The eldest, he makes sure is on Jacob's right side because that's the side of the blessing. And then his youngest is on the left. Bless my children. Here we go once again, right? We got Joseph who's limiting God. There's one blessing. It's got to go to the eldest. And what does Jacob do? Jacob crosses his hands. And Joseph gets upset. He's like, dad, 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 you're messed up. I'm sorry, dad, you're messing up. Yeah, yeah, no, the, the blessing has to go to the oldest. It's got to go to the right hand. But now watch what, what Jacob says here. When Joseph saw his father placing his right hand on Ephraim's head, he was displeased, so he took hold of his father's hand to move it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. Joseph said to him, No, my father, this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his hand. But Jacob said... I know my son, I know he too will become a great people and he too will become great. Once again, he got it there in his life that God is not a this or a that but God is a this and that that he can bless you in your high time he can bless you in your low time he can bless you when you're living perfect and he can bless you in the middle of your addiction in the middle of your mess whatever's going on in your life God can bless you he can throw the Pop-Tarts into your day, whether you had a bad attitude or not. He can bless you in the midst of your laziness. He can bless you in the midst of your mess. Then he'll make your mess into something great if you allow him to. Come on, church. Somebody give the Lord a honk out there. Stop limiting God. Enjoy his internet. Enjoy his Pop-Tarts. Enjoy his AC. Enjoy all of his best knowing this as you go forth that God's promises are yes and they are amen. That God will withhold no good thing for those that are blameless. And you mind yourself, wait a second, I'm blameless. Jesus paid the price for my sins. He already been paid. I don't have to pay again. That I can boldly and confidently go forth into God's throne room and say I'm blameless. Where's Get them blessings flow into my life. Wake up in the morning and go, this will be a blessed day. Yeah, you'll make mistakes. I make mistakes. David make mistakes. But God is going to find a way to bless your mess, to get the blessings in, and remind yourself the only thing that can kink up the hose of my blessing is my belief that I can't receive it. I'll kink those hose this week and walk in the goodness and blessings of God all the amazing days of your lives. Come on, Live More Baba Church. Who out there is going to be blessed? Bless going in and bless going out. Bless whatever you touch, wherever I go. Blessed in the midst of my mess and my junk that my God is a yes and amen God. Thank you so much for watching today. We want to make sure that we secure your eternity. Eternity is a simple choice. It simply means I believe in Jesus Christ, that he died and raised from the dead. It doesn't matter. You, you may think, well, I'm not good enough and I haven't lived my life right. Jesus died for all of your sins. So simply say this prayer with us. Dearly Father, I ask you right now, come into my heart, be my Lord and my Savior. I believe that I am saved. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for all my sins and was raised from the dead. In Jesus' name, amen. Be blessed. We'll see you next time.